Dear fellow activists, thank you for inviting me to speak on the reasons for ousting Duterte. He has committed so many grave crimes against the Filipino people. Such crimes constitute the reasons for his ouster. To facilitate understanding of what crimes he has committed, let me categorize them as treason, tyranny, mass murder, and plunder. As a criminal of the most serious kind, he is a traitor, tyrant, mass murderer, and plunderer. The crimes are interrelated because they are committed by Duterte as the principal criminal and his accomplices. In committing his crimes with impunity, he has turned into his accomplices and corrupted his subordinates in the executive branch, especially his fellow crooks, the military and police. He has also turned both houses of Congress into subservient tools by rigging the electronic vote count in the 2019 midterm elections. He controls the Supreme Court. His true is appointees and the appointees of previous plundering presidents whose plunder cases uh, the said court has dismissed. There is no way you can oust Duterte through impeachment by the lower house and through trial and conviction by the Senate. But there is another constitutional way of ousting Duterte in accordance with the democratic principle of people's sovereignty and the proven historic precedent of ousting the fascist dictator Marcos in 1986. The broad masses of the people can exercise their fundamental right and freedom of speech and assembly and rise up in gigantic mass actions in order to encourage the civil bureaucracy and the military to withdraw support from Duterte from the crimes that he has committed. Duterte is a big traitor he has betrayed the national sovereignty of the Filipino people in his relations with imperialist powers, especially with the U.S. and China. Despite his occasional claims of adhering to an independent foreign policy, he has in fact made himself a double puppet to the U.S. and China. This was not problematic for him until he, the U.S. strategist and Trump took the initiative in 2017 and 2018 to declare China the principal economic competitor and political rival, disrupting more than four decades of collaboration under the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. Duterte has always been a puppet of U.S. imperialism since he became president in 2016. He has kept all the treaties, agreements, and arrangements that keep the Philippines captive to the U.S. economically, politically, militarily, and culturally. He has always surrounded him, himself with pro-U.S. economic advisors that carry out the, the dictates of the U.S. and the U.S.-controlled multilateral agencies under the neoliberal policy. He has likewise surrounded himself with defense and national security advisors who are rabid agents of U.S. imperialism. As a puppet of U.S. imperialism, the worst crime that he has committed against the Filipino people is to pledge to Trump in 2017 to terminate the GRP and the RP peace negotiations and to destroy by brute force the CPP and NPA, which are the revolutionary forces of the people, as well as to carry out charter chains to allow the U.S. and other foreign corporations unlimited right of ownership of land and all other kinds of assets in the Philippines in exchange for unlimited U.S. military support and assistance for an all-out war policy and extreme repressive measures amounting to state terrorism and building a fascist dictatorship. In being the puppet of Chinese imperialism, Duterte has repeatedly declared his laying aside of the 2016 judgment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration that has upheld the sovereign and maritime rights of the Philippines in its exclusive economic zone and extended continental shelf in the West Philippine Sea and rejected the false Chinese claim of owning 90% of the South China Sea in violation of the rights of the Philippines and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Duterte has thereby encouraged China to build and militarize seven artificial islands in the EEZ of the Philippines. These are seven Chinese military bases on Philippine territory in flagrant violation of the GRP Constitution against foreign military bases. Duterte traitorously deals with China at two levels 
meaning to say with the Chinese government and with Chinese criminal triads. She has made agreements with China for onerous loans and for overpriced infrastructure projects and with provisions violative of Philippine sovereignty. And he has allowed Chinese corporations to control the national power grid and put up cell towers inside military camps, all in pursuit of, co of corruption. With regard to the Chinese criminal syndicates, the Duterte crime family has collaborated with them in the smuggling of drugs and other contraband, in building casinos on a nationwide scale, and in selling islands to them. Like all modern tyrants in the mold of Hitler, Mussolini, Suharto, and Marcos, Duterte has used the hysterical slogans of anti-communism and anti-terrorism in order to create the political basis for tyranny, the rule of open terror, or a fascist dictatorship in the service of the big bourgeoisie, be it industrial or big comparador. The trick of tyrants like Marcos and Duterte is to use demagogic language, what academic pedants euphemistically call populist, which takes the initiative to appropriate and misinterpret valid and popular grievances in order to receive the backward section of the masses and co-opt the middle to attack the advanced section. Duterte came to the presidency of the chronically crisis-stricken, semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system without presenting any positive program of upholding national sovereignty, democracy, economic development, cultural progress or the like, except offering federalism as a panacea all to its social ills and a pretext for charter chains and fascist dictatorship. In vulgar language, he simply presented himself as the strong man determined to restore law and order by using illegal and criminal means to crack down on drug and other criminal syndicates and thus surpass all the previous presidents who were derided as feeble in crime. Thus he managed to get a plurality vote of 39% to become president. The first move he made to prove that he was a strong man was to order the mass murder of thousands of poor people mostly urban slum dwellers, suspected or arbitrarily listed as drug users and peddlers. With the mass murder committed with impunity, he has sought to impress people that he gets things done, and he has been able to gain the loyalty of the police forces by corrupting them with cash, rewards, and promotions. For the mass murder and assuring them of presidential protection and impunity, in the process, he's been able to make himself the supreme drug lord and make his crime family become dominant. Most importantly to him, he has been able to spread the message that he can kill anyone who opposes him. He deliberately engages in mass intimidation. By pretending for some six months from the start of his presidency that he was seriously interested in negotiating peace with the NDRP, he sought to distract public attention from his actual all-out war policy against the revolutionary movement of the people. To gain the loyalty of military officers, he has used the methods of corrupting them with cash rewards and promotions and assurances of presidential protection and impunity in the campaigns of military suppression. It is of essential necessity for him to get the loyalty of the military through corruption and criminal complicity for ensuring the success of his scheme of imposing state dictatorship terrorism on the people and establishing a fascist dictatorship. Taking advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic, Duterte has grabbed more power by obtaining the law of state terrorism in the name of anti-terrorism and in rechanneling hundreds of billions of pesos of public funds to bank accounts of his family and his cronies under the pretext of doling out cash assistance to the tens of millions of people under lockdown and making imaginary purchases as well as token purchases of overpriced supplies for medical purposes. In the meantime, the political agents of Duterte are busy preparing charter chains under the pretext of federalism, which is in fact the centralization of powers in the hands of the fascist dictator, the orchestration of regional dynasties, and servility to foreign monopoly capitalism and the local exploiting classes. Evidence is abundant that while he was on the campaign trail for the presidency in 2016, Duterte announced through all forms and means of mass communications 
that he would wage a war on drugs and that he would eliminate the drug lords, drug peddlers and drug users, that he would use their corpses to fatten the fish in Manila Bay and other bodies of water in the country, and that the funeral parlor business and coffin makers would also thrive. As soon as he assumed the presidency, he publicly incited the police and gave out the orders to them to start the mass murder or extrajudicial killings. And to make sure that they would do so, he deployed nationwide experienced Dabao death squads to demonstrate and take the lead in killing people. He also announced the listing of drug suspects by the barangay of officers and the execution of those listed by his death squads are to be paid in cash from intelligence funds. The poor people who were listed up as drug peddlers or users became the easy targets of the experienced and newly formed anti-drug death squads. In fact, there were no orders to kill any of the drug lords except a few mayors who tried to be independent of the Duterte drug syndicate. Spared from being murdered were nearly all the mayors and all of the bigger drug lords at the level of governors and generals who immediately recognized and bowed to Duterte as the new supreme drug lord. In his first two years as president, human rights and religious organizations were able to document and report that the extrajudicial killings or mass murder of more than 30,000 victims, while the police claimed that only 5,000 were killed, supposed as a result of resisting arrest, but many more thousands were still being investigated as homicide cases under mysterious circumstances. Even if understated, the number of dead drug suspects was terrible enough, but the police were unafraid of being ac accused as murderers because no less than Duterte had assured them publicly that they would receive cash and promotions per victim and enjoy impunity, and they could legally get away with murder because they could plant evidence to frame up the victims, report them as having resisted arrest, and in any case, they would enjoy presidential protection. Since the beginning of the all-out war against the revolutionary movement, the methods of mass murder under Oplan Tokhang have been applied in the campaign of military suppression against the revolutionary movement, but at a slower rate, because the Duterte, uh, Duterte pretended to be for peace negotiations during the first nine months in office. The revolutionary movement have uh, had a far higher capacity to expose extrajudicial killings against it as well as to defend itself than the urban poor or slum dwellers. And the reactionary armed forces had a mix of tactics to intimidate and deceive the people and were assured of cash payments and merits for promotion by crediting themselves with both surrenders and kills, whether real or fake. But since Duterte terminated the peace negotiations with the NDFP and designated the CPP and NPA as terrorist organizations on December, November 23, uh, 2017 and December 5, 2017, respectively, the score in the mass murder of social <coughs> activists, human rights activists, and alleged CPP members and NPA fighters has been increasing at a faster rate than ever before. It is estimated that the mass murder of the revolutionary and non-revolutionary opponents of the Duterte regime will also rise to the level of hundreds to thousands as the implementation of the plan of the National Task Force to kill revolutionaries and social activists will be enhanced by the Duterte's uh, law of state terrorism and as charter change under the pretext of federalism and parliamentarism will be carried out within the next two years to establish a full-blown fascist dictatorship. To get himself elected to the presidency and to put one over his rivals, Duterte pretended to be being clean and honest and being against the oligarchy, aside from being against the drug lords. He received the most applause for these demagogic spiels, but in fact, the biggest Filipino funders of the Duterte presidential campaign were the biggest plunderers, including the presidential's predecessors, who made a deal with him 
to have the plunder cases against them dismissed by the courts. The Marcoses, Arroyos, Estradas, and their big cronies were the biggest financiers of the Duterte campaign, aside from the Chinese business and criminal groups. As soon as Duterte became president, he had the plunder cases against his fellow bureaucrat capitalists and oligarchs dismissed before the San Diego Bayan and Supreme Court, and himself, his family, and his Dabao group of Filipino and Chinese cronies started to carry out their plundering schemes. They shook down the enterprises of big businessmen whose presidential candidates lost in the 2016 elections and set up their own corporations and projects to engage in infrastructure projects, provide supplies to the civil and military agencies of the government, and secure loans from government financial institutions and other banks. Duterte has brought about unprecedentedly larger appropriations for his own presidential office and for various government uh, agencies to which he appointed trusted agents in order to steal public funds or take cuts from projects requiring government permits, franchises, or approvals, as well as state financing or government purchases. The big prize was supposed to be the onerous loans and overpriced infrastructure projects arranged with China, amounting to 24 billion US dollars in exchange for the sellout of Philippine sovereign rights over its exclusive economic zone in the Philippines, in the West Philippine Sea, and for the building and militarization of artificial islands there. But only a small part of the aforesaid money has been released because China has been pressing Duterte to make a more brazen surrender of Philippine sovereign rights over its exclusive economic zone and the undersea oil and gas resources. China was not satisfied by Duterte, merely uh, by declaring to lay aside the 2016 judgment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in favor of the Philippines, allowing China to build and militarize the artificial islands and haggling over joint ownership and joint exploration of the undersea oil and gas resources. Neither has China been satisfied by gaining control over the national power grid and the erection of China Telcom Dito cell towers and military camps in contradiction with U.S. military facilities under the Visiting Forces Agreement and uh, EDCA. It is the great misfortune of the Filipino people that every time that there is a president like Marcos or Duterte who wants absolute power, his purpose is of course absolute corruption. The rapid accumulation of ill-gotten wealth like Marcos in the past, Duterte wants to have the, the utmost power as bureaucrat capitalist to make himself the biggest comprador and biggest landlord in the Philippines. The scheme of fascist dictatorship is aimed at plundering the public resources, thus aggravating and deepening the underdevelopment of the economy, unemployment and mass poverty of the people. Even under current conditions of COVID-19, Duterte and his gang of crooks and butchers are stealing hundreds of billions of pesos of public funds, while the people in their tens of millions are deprived of livelihood, the promised assistance and medical attention. They have fattened their secret bank accounts by bankrupting the government and the economy and sinking them deeper in debt. The law of state terrorism railroaded in Congress and signed by Duterte is intended to protect the ill-gotten wealth of Duterte, family, and cronies, and to propel the drive for a fascist dictatorship. I think that the reasons I have given for the ouster of Duterte are more than enough. It is the duty of all Filipinos to decide what needs to be done in order to arouse, organize, and mobilize the people for gigantic mass actions similar to those that encouraged the withdrawal of support from the fascist dictator Marcos by his own bureaucracy and military. The economic and political crisis of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system has become so bad that the traitorous, tyrannical, genocidal and plundering Duterte regime is in deep trouble. The crisis conditions favor the rapid 
growth of both the legal democratic mass movement and the armed revolutionary movement. The movement to oust the Duterte ruling clique is rising fast. But if Duterte can somehow remain in power any longer with the use of state terrorism, the revolutionary opportunities will grow not only for the ouster of the Duterte regime, but also for the overthrow of the entire ruling system of big compradors, landlords and bureaucrats who are servile to foreign monopoly capitalism. In trying to rule the Philippines beyond 2022, Duterte is unwittingly generating the most favorable conditions for the advance of the People's Democratic Revolution and the overthrow of the current unjust ruling system.